Hi, welcome back to STS 1451. Let's get into our next lecture. Some of our keywords, concepts, and names from today include nosology, repertoire of symptoms, prescriptive norms, Abraham Flexner, Flexner Report, Eclectics, and then from our reading, Chick Jin, Mary Mellon, George Soper, Nativism, Xenophobia, and Healthy Carrier. We ended class last time by noting that some new parents prefer natural birth to hospital birth. This ongoing debate points out some of the key terms we can take for granted. As I said last time, pay attention to how primary sources use terms such as natural, advanced, norm, healthy. There are often some assumptions that are packed into the way people use those terms. So they're words that you can pay attention to as you're analyzing. Systems of classification. The process of gaining medical expertise, whatever your sect, involved codifying different repertoires of symptoms into categories of illness. By repertoires of symptoms, I mean symptoms that come together. So if you just have a runny nose, you're not going to think it's a cold or flu. You'll just assume it's allergies unless you also have aches and pains or a fever or mucus of a certain color. You're looking for symptoms that all come together in order to create the way that we understand a disease. The technical term for this process of classification is nosology. It's not nosology. Nosos is a Greek term for disease. That's where the word comes from. Categories of illness are useful for codifying treatment or therapeutic regimen, but they're also fluid and subject to debate. So one problem that people with a serious illness is like, um, say multiple sclerosis, for example, might have is if they experience fatigue all of the time, they might not know if that's a symptom of their disease or a side effect of their medicine. A lot of medicines that are given, especially for chronic illnesses, have a whole wide range of side effects. And so it can be really hard to tell where the disease ends and the um, response to treatment begins. And how do we know where one disease ends and another disease begins? How can we tell a symptom from a side effect? Classification symptoms, or sorry, classification systems also affect the public's relationship with med medical expertise. We saw Channing argue for the importance of understanding the profession of medicine as a whole, but without a standardized educational model, what doctor can claim such an expertise? So while when Channing was writing, he was the person who was critiquing women midwives, there wasn't just um, one board certification in order to become a doctor. There are all different types of ways people are educated. We're gonna talk about how medicine became standardized in this lecture today. In 1910, Abraham Flexner, this gentleman over here, published medical education in the United States and Canada. We just call it the Flexner Report. This report commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching sought to increase prerequisites for admission to med school and to standardize the material taught therein. As a result of the Flexner Report, dozens of medical schools were closed, including all but two medical schools attached to historically black colleges and most alternative medical schools. Because this document changed medical education dramatically, I chose two sections from it as our primary source of the day, but you can find the entire Flexner Report online if you want to study more of it. I will discuss chapter 10 on the medical sex and chapter 14 on medical education of the Negro, but you might be interested in chapter 13, medical education of women and other chapters. This is from chapter 10, page 156. Modern medicine has therefore as little sympathy for allopathy as for homeopathy. It simply denies outright the relevancy or value of either doctrine. Sectarians in the logical sense above discussed are one, the homeopathists, two, the eclectics, a new word for the Thompsonians. Remember Thompsonian, or Samuel Thompson and the Thompsonians were the ones who believed that medical expertise should be in the hands of everyone and democratized. The physiomedicals, the osteopaths, all of them accept, in theory at least, the same fundamental basis. They admit that anatomy, pathology, bacteriology, physiology must form the foundation of a medical education, to use the words broadly, so as to include all varieties of therapeutic procedure. So what we're starting to see here, we had lots of different sects that had lots of different types of expertise and knowledge. 
the rise of scientific medicine, as we've been talking about it, involved all of these different sects starting to say the importance of science to different applications within their own specialization. And Flexner wants to go a step further and standardize everything and get rid of sects. On the laboratory side, though the homeopath admit the soundness of the scientific position, they have taken no active part in its development. Nowhere in homeopathic institutions, with the exception of one or two departments at Boston University, is there any evidence of progressive scientific work. So now Flexner is saying it's not good enough to just believe in the laboratory. You have to be actively contributing to the laboratory in order to be considered a good enough medical school. That's a major shift from considering that the post-lab view is really new. This is 1910, and remember Cunningham talked about the post-lab identity of disease arriving in the 1890s. On the eclectics, none of the schools has anything remotely resembling the laboratory equipment with which all claim in their catalogs. The Cincinnati institutions possess a new and attractive building thus far meagerly fitted out. The New York School has a clean building with chemical laboratory in which elementary chemistry can be and apparently is taught properly. The remaining five eclectic schools are without exception filthy and almost bare. They have at best grimy little laboratories for elementary chemistry. So he's gonna say, if you do not have a clean, well outfitted lab with really expensive equipment, you do not cut it as a medical institution anymore. All right, now we're gonna get into the medical education of the Negro, page 180. The medical care of the Negro race will never be wholly left to Negro physicians. This is what we call paternalism, the idea that white experts know better and therefore have to take care of non-white people who inevitably know less than them, and it's obviously a form of racism. Nevertheless, Flexner goes on, if the Negro can be brought to feel a sharp responsibility for the physical integrity of his people, the outlook of their mental and moral improvement will be distinctly brightened. The practice of the Negro doctor would be limited to his own race, which in turn will be cared for by better by good Negro physicians than poor white ones. So he's advocating for segregation and saying, you know, there's no way that a black doctor could ever attend to a white patient. That actually was a practice that was used to disenfranchise black doctors who went to medical school. Actually, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, who is a really famous historian, sociologist, and writer um, from the early 20th century, wrote this novel. I don't necessarily recommend it on its literary merits, The Dark Princess, um, which is about a medical student at Harvard, a black medical student who is never able to complete his degree because no hospital will let him do his residency where he'd have to work with white women. So this is a form of institutional racism. Flexner goes on, quote, but the physical well-being of the Negro is not only of the moment to the Negro himself. 10 million of them live in close contact with 60 million whites. Not only does the Negro himself suffer from hookworm and tuberculosis, he communicates them to his white neighbors precisely as the ignorant and unfortunate white contaminates him. The Negro must be educated not only for his sake, but for ours. That use of ours there tells you who he's writing to. He doesn't imagine black doctors are going to read this. He imagines his entire audience is going to be white. He is, continuing the quote, as far as human eyes can see, a permanent factor in the nation. He has his rights and due and value as an individual, but he has besides the tremendous importance that belongs to a potential source of infection and contagion. You should be thinking about our readings about xenophobia, nativism, and ideas about race and contagion when you read a passage like this. The fraught legacy of Flexner. So Flexner went through um, and eradicated a lot of practices that now in retrospect we would say were dangerous or unfounded in science. Um, here's a newspaper article where he talks about factories for the making of ignorant doctors. We want our doctors to understand physiology and, you know, of uh, science in general. I think that's something that today is a shared value, even though it was something that it took a lot of time to get the public to agree in. But he also had other biases that get built into that scientific knowledge. 
I improve standards, he might say, but based on my biases, how do you think I define norm or healthy? Is it my fault that some specific assumptions about who spreads illnesses seeped into my universalism? So Flexner is clearly a person who comes after the age of universalism. He's a post-lab person. He really cares about laboratories. And yet he thinks that disease is spread by black people and by poor, ignorant whites. So he doesn't imagine disease as being circulated among educated white people. And that bias is really important. We're gonna see it come up again and again. Over the last few lectures, we've seen the gradual turn to scientific medicine. Some catalysts in the shift included Cook's postulates from 1884 and the Flexner Report. Although these trends emphasized universalism and rationality, they also disenfranchised women and minorities, consolidating medical expertise in the hands of genteel white men. So there were women who were really active in some of the sects. I mentioned Margaret Cleves was a really active electrotherapeutist. Women literally got kicked out of their professions. Medical schools in HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities were closed by Flexner. Um, these standards basically made it so that the institutions where only white men attended were the only institutions that continued to receive accreditation and funding. Our next few readings are gonna spotlight some of the consequences of those trends. What happened to those disenfranchised experts? I had a student ask me this the last time I taught the class. So Flexner's report came out, it closed tons and tons of medical schools. What happened to all of the people who were training there? Could you imagine if you were going to a university and then partway through your degree, it suddenly closed? The answer is they moved into ancillary or related fields. They created settlement homes, advocacy groups. They moved into home economics, domestic science, and other activist outlets. So they might have continued to practice medicine in small communities. They might have um, home economics and domestic science. I, we tend to think of these things now as learning to sew and cook, um, but that's also where a lot of herbalism and other kinds of home remedies were taught. Um, it's also a way that women learned about medical science. These are just a few examples of uh, women, particularly in Native Americans. Um, up top here, we have a black school where uh, knowledge continued to be passed on, just it was no longer considered medical knowledge for becoming doctors. Meanwhile, the move towards scientific medicine also consolidated pre-existing biases regarding racism, xenophobia, which is the fear of foreigners, and nativism, which means the feeling that people who already live in a place, even if they were descended from immigrants, should have more rights than newer immigrants. In 1893, the US Congress instituted the National Quarantine Act, which allowed for the inspection of immigrants for disease. This is an interesting ethical conundrum because on the one hand, you know, look what happened with COVID-19. You don't want someone who has a deadly illness that is communicable to come into your country and spread it around. Um, we had travel bans that were initiated way too late and ineffectively here, obviously, um, for COVID-19 specifically. But this also comes with the idea that immigrants are the source of disease, as if real Americans um, don't spread disease, which is ridiculous. We're all humans and we all are vulnerable to disease in the same way. This was um, a political cartoon in a magazine called Puck from 1883 called The Kind of Assisted Immigrant We Cannot Afford to Admit. Um, it's a little pixelated here. I have it linked as an option for you to study in paper one. It's um, clearly an image of death coming in on a ship of immigrants. A version of this law and mentality indoors as we are reading about today between 1991 and 1994, 260 Haitian immigrants were imprisoned in Guantanamo because the U.S. would not admit HIV-positive immigrants, but these individuals had valid reason to seek asylum. So they were in sort of a legal um, middle ground where we couldn't just send them back because they had a reason to seek asylum, but we couldn't let them into our country because of quarantine laws. We can also see the effects of these laws and the way people treated Asian Americans after the spread of COVID-19. What happens when the contagion threat already lives in the US? Pay attention to Alan Kraut's discussion of Chick Jin and Mary Mallon. 
What can we learn from those examples? Patient zero, the first documented case in an epidemic. Mary Mellon, or as she is reductively known, Typhoid Mary and Chick Jin were important cases in the history of thinking about contagion and public health. They lived before Flexner's report, but Crouch shows us that the same biases that influenced Flexner shaped the way these figures were treated. Mary Mellon was particularly interesting as a healthy carrier, a concept that makes no sense in a pre-lab mindset. So remember in the pre-lab mindset, you treat symptoms, you're basing the patient off how the patient naturally feels and you're not looking in their blood for little organisms. The idea that you can get people sick when you're not showing illness yourself just makes no sense according to that paradigm. And I have included a link to a video about Mary Mellon. It's really over the top, um, but I've taught it in previous semesters and students tend to like it. George Soper, the public health specialist who tracks her down, has a really funny beard and um, it really dramatizes Mary Mellon's case and this conflict of her just not believing that she could possibly be a healthy carrier when she's not sick um, and the public health crisis of spreading typhoid. So how else do our readings relate back to our discussion of the shift from specificity to universalism and pre-lab to post-lab? That's a question for you to consider on your own. I think that you should have all of the tools to get through this and I look forward to seeing what you write. Have a good day.